Limbus Corporation. We spent approximately 16 years with uh, science applications, international cor in corporations, and also served as senior finance director and deputy to VC finance for $1.8 billion division of General Dynamics Information Technology. Let's welcome Mr. Eric McKinnon. Thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I don't have the uh, microphone right now, but if you can hear me, that's that's great. You can have it. Yeah, yeah, please. Are, can we do that? Yes, yes. Okay, great. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, thanks to Amal, and I, mind you, I probably said your name wrong. But uh, th these gentlemen I feel a, a special closeness to, primarily because I was supposed to be here, um, I guess that was in February. January. Uh, January, yeah, it was right in January. Yeah. I was supposed to be here, come here and speak. I ate something wrong at the hotel. I don't know what it is. I was in the hospital for three days and I was asleep and next thing you know I saw these two guys were sitting at my bedside. I didn't know who they were. I thought they were part of the hospital staff. I didn't know, but you know, it gave me a picture of the, of the warmthness and the, the kindness of this group. And so I appreciate it and I feel a bit of a connection. So, um, you know, plus uh, I was in such a bad state. I'm pretty sure they saw my backside, you know? <laughs> but uh, I'm kidding. Um, let's, let's have fun with this session, okay? I like to have fun. I like to keep it interactive. So if you have questions, you want to ask about something, go right ahead. We'll keep it interactive. We'll have fun. Um, and this is, is kind of going to be more of a teaching style uh, in what, what we're doing. Um, I enjoy teaching. I've spent time, I would mention earlier, um, spent time in Saudi Arabia teaching uh, with the Ministry of the Interior there. Um, I've done some teaching in the United States in between my consulting work. Um, so it's just something that I enjoy doing, and I enjoy connecting with our audiences. Um, if you have a hard time understanding me, please let me know. One of the things I've learned is that we all speak English, but we speak a different dialect of English for sure. So for I will tend to say apple instead of apple. I will tend to say tomato instead of tomato. But if you have a problem, just say, hey, I didn't understand you. Let me know, and I will try to adjust or slow down, do whatever is necessary. Okay? Um, do we have a clicker? I got the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So we can see those things here. All right. Okay, make sure I know which one does what. That's to go forward and that's back. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is um, translating project performance. So the work that you do, your execution, all of that that we do, translating that into actual profitability and cash flow, okay? Um, and then some of those things came out a little bit in the last session and we'll talk about that. And, and um, for a project, it's really important that, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of all the good things we want to do, we want to meet the scope, we want to be on schedule, you know, hit the cost targets, do all those types of things. But at the end of the day, pretty much every project, whether you're talking about a nonprofit organization, whether you're talking about um, an internal project, all of them have some type of a profit impact or a goal, and there's cash flow with it. And so this is kind of um, a focus, uh, if I can kind of bring some some uh, perspectives from the United States is it's very much you know money oriented from a standpoint and that's true everywhere in the world right at the end of the day you have to deliver in a way that is profitable why would you do it right no one wants to be involved with that so um, let's go forward and look a bit uh, this is a little bit about my background um, sometimes it helps to bring those things up so I was a vice president with a company called Science Applications International Corporation they were a large systems integrator um, worked with uh, companies, they were kind of the, the glue or the integrator between some of the bigger companies like Boeing and General Dynamics and, and some of the others. And um, so a lot of high tech IT projects, a lot of uh, systems integrations. So some of the, um, the fancy things that you see on TV, you know, when, when back when they had the war, when they had to send out a missile and they go out and get Saddam Hussein and knock on his door and, you know, the missile blows them up, you know, those types of projects. And so the project management disciplines that go around those types of programs are very intense. And so some of what I'm gonna bring is gonna come from that background, some of those perspectives. Some things I intentionally did not edit out because I want to talk about them and then see how they may translate into uh, business here in India. Um, so I work with uh, Project Controls, which is kind of a little bit on the, the in-between space between accounting and project management. So that's a lot of where I've spent my career. So I kind of put one foot in this land and then put another foot in this other uh, land between project management and accounting. Um, 
spent about four years implementing an ERP system uh, with one of those companies as well, and I've done some of that with some of my clients as well. Um, and working in uh, revenue recognition, accounting, um, earned value management, you know, how many people have their PMP, right? I think we got a lot of people, right? Oh man, almost all everybody here has got their PMP, right? So you remember in order to pass that cost section, right? You had to do what? Earn value management, they talked about that. So cost variance, schedule variance, plan value, all of that type of stuff. So I spent a lot of time in that space um, because earn value is something that's actually required on um, US government contracts that are over a certain dollar value where the risk is with the government as far as the cost exposure. So it's a requirement and it's something that's, um, that's very large there. Um, then I also worked more on the finance and accounting side with uh, General Dynamics Corporation, which is, uh, at that time was about a $32 billion corporation, and I was the senior director of finance for about a $1.8 billion uh, piece of that. And um, there I was involved with a lot of the financial planning analysis, accounts receivable, and, and managing the ERP system. So that's kind of the space that I'm coming from. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about money. So we want to help you gain a basic understanding of the factors that uh, influence financial controls. Um, gain a basic financial uh, accounting literacy um, as it pertains to projects and understand some of the drivers of profit and cash flow and, and help develop your understanding um, you know, from the concerns of what the corporation looks for, right? So, so a big part of it is what does the company look for um, and what are the executives thinking, right? So as project managers, we mentioned earlier, we want to meet scope, we want to meet schedule. You know, hopefully we think about the money side. But the executives are thinking about it from a very different perspective, and they're expecting certain results. So we talked about transitioning your career maybe from, from project management into some of the business leadership. Being able to speak that language is going to help you be able to do that. Okay? And I'm trying to figure out how I can see my slides at the same time and back up, so I guess I'll, I'll move over here a little bit. Um, so just a little bit of a caveat. Um, this presentation has been given a number of times and generally it's focused around some of the uh, businesses that work in the Washington DC area um, and it had a government contracts flavor. So some of the terms and some of the things I may use may reflect that, um, that government contract flavor there. Um, and uh, so I've intentionally left some of those uh, materials in there as I mentioned before, okay? If it's less important, I'll skip over the slides, but um, hopefully you're gonna make the slide deck available to anybody who wants that and um, they can get a copy and, and work. As far as you are okay with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it, you know, so that's all good. All right, wonderful. So let's talk about two different things, all right? And um, projects, you know, project managers have to deliver on time, do all that stuff that we talked about. But at the end of the day, companies care about two things. They care about profit, and they care about cash flow. So, and notice I said profit, I didn't say revenue, right? So you can grow your revenues, and you can, you know, have all these great sales, but if it doesn't translate into profit, if it's little profit or no profit at all, or worst case, it's a loss, it's not that good, right? So when we talk about uh, some of the companies in the United States, sometimes we will refer to Wall Street, right? Wall Street only cares about these two things, right? And it's a very black and white type of a, type of a situation. So they don't really care about anything else but those two things happen. And this is important even if you have an internal project, because guess what? If the cost increase for your internal project, it affects your capitalization rates, it affects all kinds of different things, and it also impacts profit as well. So just because you don't see a profit and loss statement as it pertains to your project, doesn't necessarily mean that what your project is doing doesn't impact the bottom line. So um, I, can't, I was told I can't say too much about my current engagement. I'm working for Tata Motors, so they don't want me to use them as examples, but it is internal, it is the in, internal projects that I'm working with and so obviously they care a lot about that, okay? All right, so let's talk about two things. So let's look at two sides of the house. So there are profit objectives and there are cash flow objectives. And so I wanna talk about some of the things that impact profit and then also talk about some of the things that impact cash flow. So profit objectives can be influenced by the type of contract that you have. And so, um, you know, I've heard different things about the types of contracts that are used in India and those that are not. Um, I'm going to borrow a little bit from some of the, the different types that you see in the United States and to see how those translate over because that will greatly impact the type of profit impact that you have for your contracts. Um, some of you may work in manufacturing. I think that's more the case where you start dealing with indirect rates. You start talking about overheads and fringes and things like that. Um, that becomes very important. Um, and then talk about project financial controls. How do you actually 
keep your project under control financially. What does actually the word control mean? And so we'll, we'll focus in on that a little bit. Um, talk briefly about revenue recognition. That's an interesting concept that um, maybe not everyone has been exposed to, but it's important. And no matter what country you're in, whether you're in Europe, you're in, you're in India, you're in the United States, companies care about recognizing revenue and recognizing profit and how that happens. Um, and then the other piece of that is how you manage risk, how you manage your reserves, how you manage the what ifs that can happen on your project. So those things are going to impact you uh, one way or the other. So whether you deal with it or not is a different question, but risk is always something that's there. So we'll talk about those. Those are the things that impact profit um, objectives. And then we'll talk a little bit about cash flow, um, uh, cash flow objectives. So again, contract payment and billing terms, right? How is it that you've negotiated some of those commercial items? that we talk about. Um, I think that was mentioned earlier in the previous presentation as well, like some of the commercial side. Understanding that piece is very important. Um, as you go into setting up some of your uh, items within your billing and your, your ERP system and those types of things, a project manager needs to be familiar with those things so they can interface with the accounting staff to make sure those things ha happen appropriately so your clients can get billed, you can get paid on time, and those types of things. At the end of the day, one of the things that I've noticed is this is that cash flow is kind of like a game, in a sense. And the person that can get their invoices out and get them paid the fastest wins. That's really kind of how that works. And um, there's all kinds of things that can happen from the time that you actually do the work to the time that you actually get paid for. So I can do as much work in the world, but if I don't get paid for it, it doesn't get translated into cash, none of, none of, and nothing that I've done actually matters by that point. So that's a lot. Um, labor, labor categories and qualifications management, that's probably not something that comes up a lot here, unless maybe you're doing go uh, government contracts with the government of India, I'm not sure. Um, and then we'll talk about how do you measure how fast you turn revenue into cash. And so I'm actually going to give some, some, uh, some uh, examples, some financial examples and some things like that. Hopefully that doesn't uh, lose anyone and we'll just see kind of what we're looking at for time. But uh, we're going to go deep into it. There's a lot of content here. So again, this is more like a class than it is a general talk. So you know, get your uh, get your seat belts ready and uh, let's go. Okay, sound good? Okay. So financial skills um, or to topics of most most impacting profitability. So these are the things on the profit side that we want to talk about. Okay. Now I'm not going to assume that everyone knows every term, but I'm going to go ahead and just talk about those. What do we talk about in revenue? So revenue, when we say that, we're talking about the total compensation to be received by a company for goods or service. And it's usually recognized incrementally. So you may not have it in your pocket just yet, right? But every company makes some type of a statement about the sales that they are generating, okay? How often, when, all that stuff is a, a, a very big topic, right? So you can't, you can't book a contract and then say, oh, I'm gonna recognize all the revenue now. It doesn't work that way, right? So those are some things that we'll talk about, right? Then there's expenses. How do I recognize expenses? So sometimes companies, they uh, accrue costs and they put it in the balance sheet, all types of different things. How, do, how does cost end up on my project? What are those costs? What are those things I have to think about? So when I'm thinking about the profitability of my contract, I need to think about how much money am I gonna get for doing this work? Then I also have to think about what's it gonna cost me to do that? What's the cost of labor? What's the cost of materials? any other types of expenses, any allocated overheads that come um, from, uh, you know, from, from your internal expenses, all those things have to be in some way accounted for in your project. Now, not every company, uh, especially I notice um, more so outside of this government contracting field that I'm familiar with, um, not every company allocates overheads directly to projects. But it's important to understand how that will impact you because at the end of the day, that does impact the profitability that's in the entire company. So those are things that, that it helps to be aware of. And then finally, the difference between revenues and expenses is always the profit, right? And that's what's uh, recognized on your profit and loss statement. Those are the things that um, are important. And so, so we'll talk a little bit um, about those things as well, okay? So let's talk about contract types and applications. Now this is absolutely 100% deeply embedded in US government federal contracting. However, I think the principles translate over because there's still some basic flavors of contracts that apply pretty much anywhere in the world. So I'm gonna talk about these and then you know, I, I'm welcoming some dialogue as to what type of arrangements you tend to see um, on contracts, whether it be commercial or whether they be um, governmental contracts. And so the first and most commonly uh, you know, uh, type is a firm fixed price contract, right? 
And so with that, you get paid X number, uh, X amount of money to do a particular scope, to do a particular job. Now, th there's some good things about it. If you plan it well and you, you can execute your costs, keep your costs low, you have the potential to maximize your profit. However, there is a bad side to working with a fixed price contract. If your costs wind up being more, then you'll lose money, potentially, or you'll minimize your profit and you have to watch your scope. And so you don't want to sign up for a fixed price contract where the customer doesn't know what they want. They're all over the place. They're changing their minds. They want to do this. Somebody talked about gold plating. Fixed price contract is not the place to do gold plating to do any of those types of things. So that's one piece that that's probably encountered a lot. I've seen that here in India. Um, and that's probably a common, a common form. But one of the things that we have in an instrument and just the term that we use um, in the US it's called a time and materials contract. And so this is typically a fixed labor rate. So, hey, I'm going to charge, um, I don't know, uh, 8,000 rupees per hour or something like that for my work. And, um, and that's always the fixed rate. So that's, you know, I send you a bill every month and I get paid for that. Plus, I send you an invoice for my travel, my expenses, those types of things. You might run into that in a consulting environment or you know, typically in the United States, we have lawyers, right? They get paid by that, the advocates, or you know, they get paid on an hourly basis, right? So in this case, the, the scope can be somewhat flexible because you know, I get paid on an hourly, you know, hourly rate. Now, the thing that you have to be careful about with that is that if you have a big contract and you're working multiple people, you have to make sure that all of those people fit within the different labor categories and the billing rates that you've established for those different, um, those different categories. And so if I'm selling out um, IT professionals, I'm selling out engineers, senior engineer, mid-level engineer, bottom level engineer, whatever it is, I have to make sure that I can hire people that stay within that, especially if it's a multi-year contract and I'm working with, on those things. Now, another form that probably you don't see much here is um, you have what are called cost reimbursable type contracts. And so what that is, is where um, a client will necessarily will pay your expenses so that includes your labor expenses, your overheads, your fringes, all those things that get allocated. Plus, they'll pay you a fixed fee amount that goes on top of that. And they've got some variations of that where you've got award fees and incentive fees and different bonuses to, to incentivize. But those are some of what they have available there. Now, um, I won't go into each one of these because that's going to be probably a bit much um, right now and it's too specific. But however, I do want to get this concept across here is there are, there's a, there's a, a spectrum here to look at and that you have a contractor's risk and reward, right? So what is it that you get out of it? And then what's the customer's risk, right? So now any type of a contract vehicle where they pay you on an hourly basis or they pay your expenses, they do those things, they bear more of the risk because if the project doesn't achieve its goals, you still get paid anyway, you get paid all that. So from your perspective, maybe that's better, but from the customer's perspective, they're gonna want much tighter financial controls, much tighter reporting. They wanna understand what you're doing for that money that you're charging them every month, right? Now, on the other side, if I've got firm fixed price type vehicles, I've got those things, now who bears the risk? Contractor. Yeah, contractor bears that risk. You bear the risk if you're performing because if you over or underspend, you know, um, underspending is great, more profit, overspending, that's a problem, right? And so, you know, your, your internal stakeholders will not like that, okay? So understanding some of those things is gonna be important. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this because this is gonna get really deep into some of the accounting, but um, typically think about your expenses in two different types of categories. You're gonna have direct expenses, like what are the expenses of actually executing this project? So I'm gonna have my labor costs, I'm gonna have um, materials, you know, whatever it is. I've got subcontractors, I've got all those different things that are direct expenses. However, there are indirect expenses, whether your company allocates them to projects or not, you still have to think about those expenses. So rent for company facilities, employee benefits, um, you know, your, apart, your accounting department costs, your contract support. Um, sometimes the co companies have what they call GNA, general administrative, that gets allocated costs down from the CEO, you know, all those type of expenses. And so when you think about your expenses, you can't just think about what's on the left-hand side here. You have to think about whatever is on that right-hand side. And so 
whether your company allocates that in the accounting or not, those things still happen, and it's important to be aware of that. And so as a project manager, the more you're aware of those other things, the more you're gonna be able to climb the ladder, connect with people in the corporate side who care about all of this stuff, okay? All right, so these are some of the, the, the commonly held um, accounts that are used in the, in the US side of things. Usually we'll have an on-site and off-site overhead rate, so it has to do with whether, you know, who's paying for my office and my telephone? Is the client paying for that or am I paying for that? And so sometimes I may have a different rate for allocating that. French benefits, I don't know if you all do that here where you have your insurances, all that kind of stuff, your health insurance, all that, that stuff gets built into, um, you know, indirectly it's kind of part of your pay rate. You don't really get it directly, but it's part of a benefit that you get and that cost has to be accounted for. And then we talked about some of the general administrative expenses. And, um, and then you may have some type of expenses that deal with um, putting subcontracts in place, putting um, different suppliers in place. And so however you all do it, there's just different buckets and things that you have to think about from an indirect expense category standpoint. Um, I won't go again into all this stuff. That could be a little bit too detailed. But this is kind of an example of how you might allocate some of those expenses if you were trying to get an understanding of how it impacts your contract. So you can, in theory, take take some of those overheads and some of those indirects, the fringes, all those things that you might see at the whole corporate level, and then look at those percentages and then apply those to your individual costs that you're gonna have on your project. And so in this case from the left, you can look at, you might say, hey, I've got, I'm gonna talk in US dollars because that's what I know. Um, you might have direct labor of $100, plus you might have 32% build up on your direct labor for your fringes, your insurance costs, and then you have um, your overheads that they get, get attached to it, your general administrative expense. So at the end of the day, it might cost you $100 per hour for, for a person, but it's close to $200 an hour after you consider your burdens and after you consider your indirect expenses. And so these are the types of analyses that need to take place sometime to really know how much your project is making because you might feel like you're doing great. Hey, look, I've got margin, but then you haven't uh, factored in all these other um, factors that go in as well, okay? Now let's talk about project financial controls. Um, this is a favorite uh, little model of mine that I've developed some years ago, and um, it's a good basis for, for talking about some things, and I, I kind of have some fun doing it as well. Okay? Um, think about a system for how am I going to control the cost, how do I control the schedule, how do I control the scope for my project, right? And think about it from a systems view. And I like to talk about it from the standpoint of um, many things are a system, right? Our human bodies are a system. So my human body has some purposes, right? Um, what's the number one goal of my human body for any human person? What is it? Survive. Survive, right. I want to stay alive. I want to not be eaten if there's a lion. I don't want the lion to eat me. I want to get food every day. I want to do some basic things, right? Those are goals of the system of my body. My goal, my body wants to keep its heart beating, right? All of those things are there. And so those are goals. And so when you think about the goals for your project, there are some goals that you have. You want to meet your scope. You want to meet your cost targets, right? You know, and then you want to meet the schedule. Those are things that you want to do. And there's a whole host of other requirements that may get identified. All those things that have to be there, right? Now, if I'm start talking about project controls, I'm borrowing from an engineering model a little bit to say, what does it mean to actually control the system, right? So in order to do that, I have to have goals, but I also have to have sensors. I have to have the ability to detect if something goes outside of whatever the tolerance is. Now, what are some of the sensors that we have in our human bodies? Any ideas? Vision. Vision, right. What else? Ear. Smell, hear, touch. touch, right? All those things give me information. So when, I, when I'm a kid, right, and I go put my hand on the stove, mama said, don't put your hand on the stove, but you do it anyway. Right? Ah! Right? So you, you know, and your sensors tell you, don't do that again. It's dangerous. Now, if I didn't have any sense of touch, I would continue to keep my hand on the, on the stove and then I would fry my hand off. Right? So that would be, that, that's something where our, our sensors tell us what to do. Um, it's debatable in India, but I think that, you know, the sensors, your eyes, tell you there's a truck coming, there's a bus coming, there's something like that, watch out, don't get hit. One of the most frightening experiences I had in my life was uh, the last time I was here, I just had an Indian friend of mine grab my hand and just help me to cross the street because we had to get from one side of the street to the other and there were cars in front of us and cars behind us and that was, that was truly frightening. Um, 
Driving is very, very different here, I can tell you that. Um, so anyway, we have to have sensors to survive. We have to have sensors to know what's going on in the system. So in our particular systems, we're looking at keeping control of our costs. We might look at, we have cost reports. Those are sensors, right? It helps us to know how much we've spent. Um, earned value management, I mentioned that. Um, indirect rate variances, we can get into all those types of things. Um, and then my estimates of where my, my costs are gonna end at the end of the day, right? So all these things are things that I keep doing. I just don't do it one time. I do it weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, however often, and it gives me the ability to see what's happening on my project, okay? Now, a discriminator is what? Discriminator is to be able to tell the difference between good and bad, right? So I have to set some variances, some thresholds to say, what defines success for my project, right? How, what tolerances, what, at what point do I believe something is a problem? So when we're, I'm working with earned value management systems, what we tend to do is we establish thresholds to say, okay, if it's a variance of plus or minus 5%, I have to give an explanation of those plus or minus 5%. So those are things that you have to put in place for your project to help you to decide. And so, and your brain does that all the time, right? So when I mentioned the little Frogger example, <laughs> you know, the, the example of trying to cross the street, Frogger was an old video game, I don't know if you all remember that. But uh, it's, it's like this little frog is trying to hop across the road and he gets squashed and he doesn't do it, right? But you know, we're making choices as we go. We're looking at and say, okay, is this bus too close? Is it not too close? What do I have to do? Okay, do I go forward? Do I come back? All of those things are things that you have to have a discrimination mechanism in place to decide whether you want to do that or not, right? Now, um, let's say you have all this stuff in place, right? You do all this. Does it do you any good if you don't tell anybody about it? No, absolutely not, right? So your system has to have some feedback mechanisms in it to make sure that all those things, you've got cost reports, you've got these different things, it showed you that you're out of tolerance, your schedule is out of tolerance, whatever else have you. There has to be some mechanism that you actually feed that information back to someone who can influence it and make a change and will act on the change. And so then we start talking about what are corrective actions, right? So you have to have a system of tracking. So you come up with variances, you say this is out of tolerance, now it has to be fed back to the right people, and they have to be committed to acting on it. There has to be a tracking system that says, okay, this was an action item, we kept this thing that was out of tolerance, how do we correct that, right? And then we do what? We go back to the goals again, and we revisit the goals. Or is the goal still a good goal? Maybe I was, I was wrong with the goal. Maybe the goal needs to be adjusted. And so the system gets better and better as we go through that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, great. Can you understand me okay? Yeah. Do I need to stop speaking with the British accent? Would that be preferable? <laughs> no? <laughs> I saw there was a gentleman back here from New Zealand. I said, oh, I understand him great. <laughs> All right. Um, elements for effective cost controls. Um, work authorization and charge codes. So this is important. So uh, one of the things that's a big tenet under earned value management is that all work has to be authorized, right? Now, what I'm noticing in some cases is companies might, they collect their costs for a project, but they collect it all in one big bucket and all just kind of sits at the top of the project. And they can usually tell the difference between labor expenses or you know um, conversion costs, they may call it, and, and, and some of the uh, materials and stuff like that. But the connection to the actual work breakdown structure and where the actual work is taking place doesn't always happen, right? So in order to have good control over your cost, you need to be able to say, okay, this is a part of the work breakdown structure that's assigned to this particular group. Here's the charge code that's associated with that work. And then I don't just give them all the charge codes at one time, I do it as the work is happening. So I kind of say, okay, Amal, this is your scope of work, this is your piece of the project, here's your budget, here's your schedule, here's your charge code, right? Get that done and come back to me and I'll give you the next one, right? And so you have to have it in incremental pieces to have control. So if you turn everyone loose on everything on day one, chances are there's gonna be, you know, you're gonna come up short. Yes, sir? Uh, what are the different types of charge codes in any project, like yeah. So, like, I, I need to understand the different types of charge mm -hmm. codes, basically. Yeah. So, typically, um, the, what what you'll try to do is you will align your charge codes along with your work breakdown structure. Okay. So that's kind of a scope alignment, right? Now, depending on how your ERP system is set up, you will tend to have uh, it will be indexed with your general ledger accounts or to your cost types. 
And so you might charge the same charge code, but then, you, you know, but depending on the expense, it's different general ledger accounts that are associated with it. And the other index that goes with it is usually some type of an organizational breakdown. So I can tell what organization it was, I can tell what it was, and then I can tell, based on the breakout of the charge code, what was the scope that was associated with that work. So I may have one charge code for design and then another charge code for requirements analysis and another charge code for implementing. And that's just at a high level, but you know, go deeper. Yes, sir. Uh, I think what he's referring is because charge code terminology is basically on the kind of theory right? Oh, okay. And basically the general ledger account. That is what uh, charge code is talking about. That's one dimension of it. So usually, so think about X, Y, and Z axis, right? In mathematics, X, Y, and Z, right? So I can define a transaction in my accounting system by the, by the project dimension of that charge code. I can define it by the general ledger account that tells me is this labor, is this um, some other type of expense, is it travel, what is it, right? And then there's a who side of it, which is the organization, of which organization <coughs> incurred that expense. And so you think about it as an X, Y, and Z axis, and then you'll do you that over the something here. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what's meant by, by the charge code. So there are different types uh, that will go with that. But that depends on your accounting system. Sometimes people have to build their element of cost into the charge code. I don't like doing that, but that, that is an option. You know, that happens sometimes, okay? Um, obviously, you have to have weekly cost reports that show variances, so weekly and biweekly versus um, you know, monthly. Typically, if you wait a whole month to find out like, how you're doing on your expenses, it's probably too late. Right, so especially if you got a high burn. I mean, I worked on a project. Um, it was called the Future Combat Systems, and it was, uh, you know, it was, had all kinds of high technology. Uh, the, the piece of it that our company had was like uh, 2.7 billion dollars, and uh, Boeing was the prime, and they had like 24 billion. So it literally, you know, literally, we spent 25 million dollars a month, U.S. dollars, and that was a lot of money. So that's how fast. Like if I waited until a, a month to see where my costs are, I'm done. You know, so you want to have to have frequent looks into your costs and your expenditures. That also may dictate how your company chooses to set up their accounting, because not every company does that. They only get it monthly. Um, some of my experience so far has been that's what I've run into, and I've been trying to make recommendations say, yeah, you need to divide that into smaller pieces, okay? Um, you need to have tools to identify unapproved costs. So what do I mean by that? There's, there's expenses that have been incurred, but they're not sitting on your books yet. Right? Sometimes they will refer to those or as accrued expenditures, those types of things. Those things will bite you every time. Right? So those are things where you've done, let's say, a whole bunch, let's say half of this room all went out, they did travel, they did all this other type of stuff. But those expenses don't show up until much later. So you still have to account for those things that they're there. So part of the tracking systems is that you have to have systems and tools in place to do some of those things. Okay? And, um, Usually also there's some ability, you have to see what's normal for your project. So if, um, you know, man, I've got to think of some Indian names because I'll say Fred, Bill, and Tommy, right? <laughs> they normally charge or, you know, um, they normally charge this project, right? But then I see some other name that I don't normally see, right? So you have to be able to look at your costs and look at your expenditures and see, you know, who normally charges and to be able to say what's normal, what's not normal. So you have to be able to detect that, okay? Um, so try to look at reports as being information um, where you can actually just not just look at this data that comes out, but actually try to make it meaningful in looking at some of those things. Okay? Um, so this is a, a little interesting topic, and I won't go too deep into it, okay? um, because I don't want to lose everyone. But part of what a project manager may have to connect with is doing what they call EAC's estimate at completion, right? um, and look at revenue recognition. And I've, I've had some conversation with some of the accounting professionals that I work with now here in India, and um, the rules are very similar. So the accounting rules are very similar um, of revenue recognition and how those things work. Most of the time, there's some type of a measure of some type of a percentage of completion of the work that's done that drives how much of the revenue that I can rev recognize. How much of that can I take credit for on my uh, profit and loss statement? So when I do that, I have to, from a project manager's perspective, I have to do an accounting of what my costs are gonna be at completion, right? So doing that, I look at how much money have I spent so far, my actual costs incurred to date, what are my estimated costs to complete, labor, materials, um, other direct expenditures, 
Remember those open commitments or those things that might not show up on my books yet, but they're still there. I've got to account for those pieces, um, the accruals we mentioned, um, any pending corrections, any uh, warranties or any things like that, those things like that that you have to account for. That's a, that's a projection, along with my indirect expenses, that's a projection of what my expenditure is gonna be at the end of the day when the whole project is over, right? But then I also have to project forward, what's my revenue gonna be? How much money am I gonna get paid at the end of the day? Whether it's fixed price, whether it's time and materials, whether, whether, whatever it is, um, how much am I gonna spend? And then when I do that, I can get a future look at what my profit's gonna be and what my rate of return is gonna be on the project. And that's really what matters more so than just reporting past results. What is the future gonna look like? That's what's important for looking at that. And so those estimates can put it together. You may have to look at the WBS elements, look at your you know, control accounts. We'll talk, that's more of an earned value term, but you'll see that. I think it's probably in our PMP studies as well. Um, you might have to look at different contract line items. I don't know how your contracts are sometimes structured here. A lot of times you might get different purchase order line items that come to you, that come to you that way. Um, probably with the government stuff, it probably has different types of money that can't be mixed and those types of things that you have to look at. How many people do government contracting here in India? I'm curious. Any of you? Okay, you've done, done work like that. Okay, so you've understood. I think I'm, you have defense background, right? So you understand. I mean, I know Tata Motors does that as well. They've got, they sell you know, military vehicles, all those types of things as well. So, um, so you have to do an estimate of all those types of things. So that's a, a getting an idea of what your costs are. And I won't read through each one of these, but those are the things you have to look at. So kind of think of it like, okay, I need to look under this rock, I need to look under this rock, I need to look under this rock. And those are all the places where expenditures can happen, and I need to do an estimate of those things. All right? Um, then there's looking at the revenue side, right? It can never be more than what the value of the contract is. Um, and it's basically how much money am I going to get when I'm done at the end of the day. And I won't go into the contract types and all that stuff because I think that's going to be a bit much. But that's what you have to look at, okay? So revenue recognition is that process that we talk about of how much do I recognize along the way. Now, a lot of, a lot of uh, people, you know, worldwide, whether you're talking IFARs, whether you're talking about in the United States, we use um, generally accepted accounting procedures. Um, I looked up some of the guidance in India as well. So they're still the same general concept. Generally, they will do the same thing, and they will do what they call percentage of completion uh, revenue recognition, right? And a lot of times that's based on what they will call a cost-to-cost -cost basis. And so when you look at it, and I'll just jump into an example that might make that a little bit more um, understandable. So if I had a contract, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to talk in dollars here, of $10.9 um, million, and I, my expected uh, cost of completion is $10 million, then my profit is going to be $900, and that's going to be 9%, right? And what that winds up translating into is that based on the cost that I incur relative to my cost of completion, I get to recognize that much of the total sale. And what that winds up being is that I book that 9% every month in my cost, you know, in my, in my, in my, um, in my accounting ledgers. And so that's kind of what happens with that, okay? Now, you might say as a project manager, you say, okay, well, so what? I don't think about that. That's what the, the accounting people do. But how well you do this and how your numbers end up is going to impact you and your career and everything that goes with that. So it's important to understand that piece. Yes, sir. I think the profit you are um, um, you know, listed down here is a gross profit, not a net profit, right? Um, it depends on how you are accounting for it. So yeah. companies do that differently. So if you allocate the overheads and those yeah. types of things, I think gross, gross uh, you have taken indirect cost, direct cost, or just uh, direct cost? Um, it would be direct cost. In, in this particular example, I didn't really specify it. Okay. You know, but depending, it depends, like for example, I've gone in the UK, for example, in the United Kingdom. They tend to operate with gross profit most of the time. Um, they don't always allocate their indirects directly down to any lower levels, whether it be to the project level, whether it be higher. Um, most of my background, it would be, you know, it would be a net profit because we allocate those indirects directly to the contracts, you know. Um, but again, it depends on what your accounting system supports. So this is kind of the principle of it. So the principle will work the same regardless of how you do it. Now, this is the part that goes interesting. So you know when you go and you read about the financial results of a company, and they say company XYZ took a write-down of a billion dollars this month. And, and, you know, well, what does that mean if they took a write-down? Where does that come from? It comes from different things. But usually there's the appearance of some cost that on the income statement that wasn't there before, and now it's got to be there, right? Um, it happens all the time. It could be from because 
you know, something was capitalized that probably shouldn't have been, and then they allocated it to the income statement, and now you've got to deal with your pain, right? Similar concept happens if you are, um, if you're working on a project, you discover something bad, your estimate at completion changes, now, instead of booking that 9%, I've got a book of write down that takes me down to my new profit expect, expect, expectation, which in this particular case, in this example that I showed real quick, it's now down to 3.81%, right? So I've got to write that down in the current period and deal with that, that pain, right? So some of what you do as a project manager has a direct impact on the profit and loss of the company. And so those are things you need to look at. And I, I saw that all the time. I dealt with contracts when I was um, with some of these companies that once there was, a, there was some major change in the profit expectation for that project, and the company had to have a, you know, um, a write down for that, if it's big enough, then it makes, you know, it makes the papers, right? <laughs> you know, those things get there. So it depends on the size of your, your um, company and your contract. But you, know, you as a project manager could directly impact, um, you know, major things, impact stock price, impact all of those things. And so those things, those things matter, okay? Um, so in this particular question, it's a group question I put out there. So if revenue recognition is driven by the percentage of um, completion where revenue to be recognized is cost incurred divided by the estimate at completion of cost, revenue recognition becomes heavily dependent on what in this particular case? What's it dependent on? Your cost, yeah, it's, it's dependent on your estimate of the cost incurred, right? So if my estimate of the cost incurred goes up, even though I might not have incurred that expenditure yet, if my estimate of the cost goes up, what happens to my profit? It goes down, right. And so those are things that are very important. So as a project manager, your ability to forecast forward matters as far as the financials of the company today. Because you don't, you can't, here's the thing. With the accounting and finance piece, you can't know about a problem and then say, I'll deal with it when it happens. It doesn't work that way in accounting. When you know about a problem, you have to disclose it and it has to be factored into your revenue recognition now. That's the painful piece. You can't say, okay, well, that's going to happen a year from now, and I don't, you know, it, once you know it, you have to deal with it. And so you, once you're fairly certain, you have to deal with that financial impact today. That's kind of the basics of, of many accounting systems, okay? Because if you think about it, people are, people are making investments based on what they believe the future profitability of the company is. So if you know that there's something bad that's going to happen, and you don't disclose that, that now people are investing based on false information. And so that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Okay? All right. Let's talk about um, another piece here. How, how am I doing on time? I'm not going to just keep going. I don't want to keep going. 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes? Okay. So talk about project risk and reserves, okay? There is always uncertainty with any business activity. No matter what it is that you're going to do, there's always uncertainty. Now, what happens a lot of times is people don't account for that uncertainty. Now, when we've took our PMPs and all that stuff, you might remember hearing about management reserves. But oftentimes, management reserves aren't really directly connected with an analysis of what the potential um, risks are and what the potential impacts are. So I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. This is a template that I've used for years, um, and this is the idea. A good thing to do is not just to go through a risk analysis that's kind of in some vague um, terms or just some calculated numbers, but to actually put financial numbers into the analysis. And so, uh, what's the description of the risk? Like, what's this particular thing that could happen? What's the probability of occurrence? What's the potential cost impact if that thing happens? And then there's a weighted value that's like, take that in that case, the 50% times the 1 million says I need the, you know, 500,000 is my potential um, exposure that comes from that. Now there's some additional things I won't go too deep into. There's a cost of mitigating, right? So I say, okay, I can either leave it alone and let it happen, or I have to spend some money to make that particular thing not happen. One of the examples is, let's say, for example, you're working with a supplier. That supplier has questionable quality, um, you know, that's, that's there. You see that as a risk. So one of the things that you do to mitigate your risk is that maybe you assign quality personnel to sit on site in their manufacturing to do that. Now that guy is gonna cost some money to do it. However, if he reduces the risk of their non-performance substantially, then it's worth the expenditure. So you have to look at those things and then, then look at the reduced risk. Now, what's my residual impact? What's my residual risk? That amount 
needs to go into your reserves for your, for your project. So a project without reserves is basically saying everything's gonna go perfect, nothing's gonna happen bad, it's all gonna be just fine. It may not be just fine. So in this particular example, it says, yeah, I should reserve $300,000 for that particular risk happening, okay? All right, um, now let's shift gears and I'll spend the remaining time that I've got available talking about cash flow. So we've talked about the things that impact profit, right? But cash flow is important because guess what? Listen, I know that as a, as a, as a consultant, right? So sometimes my payments are tied into achieving uh, particular objectives and it's not always just a monthly you know, you know, pay like that. So it doesn't matter how much money that I have coming, if my wife says, hey, the bills need to get paid this month, it doesn't matter what's coming you know, a lot late. And so cash flow is important for companies. You gotta be able to pay your people. You cash gotta be able to do those different things, right? Okay, so let's talk about contract payment and billing terms. So um, oftentimes, um, you know, those terms that are in your contract drive how you get paid, and that's extremely important. So here are the term usually it has to do with commercial items, the commercial terms that are set up there. And um, one of the, like typically, it's common to have invoices paid within 30 days. So we say net 30, right? That's our term. Sometimes you get a bad deal. It might be net 45 or it might be something else. Um, you know, this is the point where now it's negotiating, right? No, I want to get paid in this particular time frame. As a project manager, you need to be able to advocate for those things, okay? Um, so billing terms that refer to the billing instructions sometimes. Sometimes a customer may want an invoice to look a certain way. I want my invoice to look like this. I want it to do that. This is the backup. I want all copies of receipts for your people, all those things. Here's the thing I'll say about that. I have an article on LinkedIn. Um, I think it's still there. I don't know if it is or not. But I said one of the things that your invoicing and your billing system should have in common with the Model T. Um, everybody remember what a Model T is? Yeah. You remember that, right? So Henry Ford invented, they say, you know, it's a debate. Some people say that Henry Ford invented the first automobile, and some people say that Carl Benz of Mercedes-Benz invented the first automobile, right? So a lot of people were playing with this idea. But here's the thing that Henry Ford invented that Carl Benz did not. Henry Ford invented the assembly yes. line. It's one, two, three, four. And he was quoted as saying a famous thing. He said, you can have any color Model T you want, as long as it's what? Black, <laughs> right? So what that meant is process matters, right? And so what happens is if you let your customer put so many unique things on you where you have to do unnatural things with your accounting system, you have to put all this back up to your invoices, guess what? It's gonna take you longer to get invoices out the door, which means it's gonna take you longer to get paid, which means you can't pay your people, right? So it's extremely important that you try to get your invoicing, say, hey, look, this is what comes out my accounting system. This is what you get. You got to push back some on some of the customers. You can't can't have a lot of things that slows get slows up getting that invoice out the door. Okay. Um, you know, 